Thank you, Francois. As a legal advisor assisting our regional legal advisors, business development managers, consultants and financial advisors, I am faced with questions and conundrums on a daily basis regarding the global citizen doing financial planning in the global village. International estate planning is becoming the norm rather than the exception and as a result it is our duty and obligation towards our clients to remain informed, to continuously upskill ourselves and to build a reference base to consult whenever we are faced with those tricky questions. We all have the potential of becoming global citizens. We can literally move around the world at will. And we can hold assets anywhere in the world. Clients are expanding their global footprint by acquiring properties and holding foreign investments in various jurisdictions. And they expect that the financial planning fraternity must advise them, no matter where and in which manner they choose to export their wealth. If nothing else, this MWI Global Citizen Initiative will show that financial planning and the landscape is anything but simple and that there is no one size that fits all, no quick and easy solution and that it's necessary to always have your thinking cap on. It is not necessarily my aim to teach you anything new today, but rather to show you that the complexities you might face when planning for this Global Citizen client. Just as important as it is to know what you know, it's probably even more important to know what you do not know and where to start when looking for those answers. I will spend some time on the international estate, where clients hold assets in different countries across the world or where they live in various parts of the world. I will share some food for thought when dealing with the typical South African client whose children and future beneficiaries have moved abroad International financial planning is no longer focused only on the South African client, as the residency of beneficiaries can result in the financial plan being ineffective with unwanted consequences. Just as each jurisdiction based their right to levy income tax on different tests and grounds, mostly residency or the source of the income, each jurisdiction also applies different rules when determining the right to levy estate duty, inheritance tax, death duties, they do not even use the same terminology for taxes payable upon death. In South Africa, being ordinarily resident is the basis on which estate duty is levied, and it is levied on worldwide assets of the deceased. If a foreign financial advisor studies the Estate Duty Act, being ordinarily resident would not be the obvious nexus at first glance. If we look at Section 2 of the Act, it basically just says, there shall be charged, levied and collected in respect of the estate of every person who dies on or after 1 April 1955, a duty to be known as a state duty. So one can easily make the conclusion that if you die in South Africa, you are liable for a state duty in South Africa. And it's only on further reading and inspection that Section 3 determines that certain assets are not included in the South African estate if the deceased is not ordinarily resident in South Africa. So on the flip side, where a client is ordinarily resident and holds some assets abroad, you will have to ask questions to find out how and when those assets were acquired. If, for an example, the assets were acquired abroad before becoming a South African tax resident, or where that was inherited from somebody that's never been a South African resident, it will not be included in the South African estate when determining the dutable estate. However, that does not mean that assets tax-free. No, the country where the assets are located might have a right to tax. So if this is ignored, it can also have detrimental consequences. We will chat about CITES tax a bit later. In the US, the right to levy death duties is based on citizenship or residency, so it's extremely wide. In France, Tax is payable on the transfer of assets upon death if the deceased was a French tax resident at the time of death or if the heir is a French tax resident at the time of death of the deceased and that heir has been a French tax resident for the last six years during the last 10 years. So quite complex. Some countries, on the other hand, do not levy any taxes on death, for example, Namibia or Australia. This does not mean that there isn't any taxes. It just means there's no estate duty type tax. There might be transfer of property tax like we've got, or there might be capital gains tax or wealth tax. So it's not to say there's no tax. If determining whether a person can in fact be taxed in a foreign country 
is so complex. Imagine if both South Africa and that foreign jurisdiction claim taxing rights. Then one will have to interpret the double estate duty agreements that exist between the countries. South Africa has double estate duty agreements with the UK, US, Canada, Sweden, and then some neighboring countries, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Lesotho, and Swaziland. So not many. If the agreement does not provide any relief, or no agreement exists, and no relief is found in the country's legislation, one would have to consult the international instruments adopted by the relevant countries, if applicable, to find a solution. One of those are the OECD's recommendation of the Council concerning the avoidance of double taxation with respect to taxes on estates and inheritances and on gifts. Quite a mouthful. So in the end, there is a possibility that double taxation can still take place if none of the above provides any relief. Therefore, it is easy to forgive someone for making the wrong conclusions when constructing a financial plan for a global citizen. Imagine a client born in the UK, married to a US citizen, living there momentarily, working in Dubai and living in South Africa for some parts of the year. Where would you start? So let's assume we have an easy client, a person that is ordinarily resident in South Africa and as a result, South African tax resident, therefore subject to income tax and estate duty in South Africa on worldwide income and assets. What happens if this client holds foreign listed shares in the US, either directly or indirectly, or a property in the UK or France? In South Africa, estate duty will be payable on worldwide assets. The US, UK and France will also have a right to tax, as they apply CITES tax to certain assets held in their territory by non-residents or foreign aliens. Facing double taxation, one will have to consult local and foreign legislation to see if any relief is provided, or the double estate duty agreement, or failing it, the relevant international instrument. In some instances, there might not be any relief, which results in double taxation, then can have a serious liquidity implication for the estate. Then, in addition to the tax problem, the foreign asset will have to go through some sort of estate administration process before it can be transferred to the eventual heir. This can require a probate process to be followed depending on the country in question or for the executor in South Africa to appoint a foreign agent, both having additional cost implications and potential time delays. This brings us to the ever popular question of whether a client with international assets should have one worldwide will or whether they should use separate wills in the different jurisdictions. And can one assume that the requirements for a valid will is the same all over the world? The answer is no. Each country can have their own set of rules to give effect to either a locally drafted or internationally drafted will. And if there is a dispute whether the will is in fact valid or not, one will have to consult the relevant international instruments in the end. In cases where clients decide to have separate wills in different jurisdictions, it is important to ensure that one will does not renounce another by accident, as it is a common clause in wills to effectively renounce or revoke all your previous wills. This can have the unintended consequence of nullifying the South African will dealing with the largest part of the estate. It is important that the wills complement each other. Care should be taken. If a client has more than one will, review those wills jointly. A very common occurrence in current political times is that many South African residents are acquiring immovable property in foreign gold and visa jurisdictions, like Portugal, Malta, Greece, to name a few. It provides for a viable plan B, and due to rental pools and property value growth, it can also provide positive investment returns. Many clients do not know that different countries have different legal systems underpinning their property ownership. And as opposed to a common law country like South Africa that allows for freedom of testation, meaning that you can bequeath your property at will, civil law countries do not necessarily allow for it. This is commonly referred to as forced airship rules and is not the same as interstate succession, as it will apply even if a client has a valid will or not. Forced heirship dictates who can benefit from property upon the death of the property owner, whether that person has a valid will or not. 
In France, for example, forced heirship rules determine that the children are the reserved heirs of their parents. In Portugal, a person may only dispose of a maximum of one third of their estate at will, depending on the family structure. The rest of their assets must be dealt with in accordance with the forced heirship rules. Another interesting point that one has to consider is that certain countries hold beneficiaries liable for estate duty and taxes incurred in the estate, and even for debts in that estate, something that must be planned for. It is necessary to highlight what impact the global family has on the financial plan of the global citizen. We generally limit our financial plan to the impact that taxes and legislation has on the deceased, but we rarely consider the impact the plan can have on the beneficiaries that are in different countries all over the world. Looking at an endowment policy, for example, if a beneficiary for ownership is nominated on a policy, and that beneficiary is a tax resident in the UK or Australia, for example, the policy proceeds may be subject to income tax in the hands of that beneficiary when he or she eventually surrenders or matures the policy. Therefore, the tax-friendly investment just became an ineffective succession vehicle, not only subject to income tax and estate duty in South Africa, but also income tax abroad. Each jurisdiction's rules will have to be considered when doing the South African client succession planning, and it is not always that simple to interpret or apply. Considering local trusts, where a South African resident has a South African family trust and the children who are the beneficiaries have moved abroad. Many foreign jurisdictions do not look favorably upon foreign trusts, imposing tax liabilities on the beneficiaries. Where the deceased appointed their children as the successive trustees of the South African trust, it can very likely result in the South African trust being forced into a foreign tax regime as many jurisdictions use the tax residency of the trustees as a basis of taxation. This is the main reason why South African tax residents are not trustees on their foreign trusts and why trusteeship is limited to foreign trust companies. As this short discussion shows, each country has their own legislation, tax rules, succession rules and the impact thereof on the financial plan can be unintended and catastrophic. Countries have different views on trusts, foreign investments, validity of wills, freedom of testation, to name a few. Not to mention all the double taxation agreements that exist between countries, or don't exist for that matter, and the international instruments that are relevant, some we don't even know exist. So how do we navigate our way? I found an extract from an article written by Ashley Murphy in my search for an explanation of what international financial planning is. He is a financial advisor, a tri-citizen of the US, UK and Australia. He specializes in the US and Australia and has lived and worked in both. And he says, taking on a client with countries that you are not specialized in, nor have worked with before, is a huge challenge. And it will consume your time with trying to learn and understand how it works for the client. He said that if you do not work and live in a country where your client lives, and work. The financial plan will never be quite as good as someone who is currently living there. Not necessarily the message we want to hear. We like to believe we can provide for all our clients' needs, no matter what or where. But we have to be realistic and acknowledge that we cannot give the same level of advice in foreign jurisdictions we have limited knowledge and practical experience in. As a starting point, you should make a conscious decision about which countries you want to focus on and learn as much as possible about those and to build up a reference base that you can use for global citizens with complex estates. You should continue to attend our global citizen workshops as it is our aim to partner with you in search for answers. We cannot necessarily give the advice, but we can ensure that you have access to information to guide you in the process of finding the best and most appropriate financial plan for the client. In some cases, it might require that the client consults with a specialist attorney or tax practitioner, or even to appoint a financial advisor in the foreign jurisdiction to be part of the client's advice team. In the quest for the most appropriate and comprehensive financial plan, there is no fixed recipe, and you have to do what is necessary to achieve that objective.